in the previous video, Schrodinger equation gives us three quantum numbers that determines the available orbitals in each atom or the available rooms in which the electrons can reside. The next step is going to be uh, for us to determine where the electrons will go first or what we call the electron configuration how we distribute the available electrons into the available orbitals. So let's start by the notation to describe orbitals in the first place. Looks like this with the coefficient corresponding to the principal quantum number n, which determines the, the energy level to which that orbital belongs. And it corresponds to the, the period number in the periodic table. The letter symbol here uh, is determined by the value of the secondary quantum number L, which determines different types of orbitals. So as we learned previously, when L equals zero, that's an S orbital. When L equals one, that's a P orbital. When L equals two, that's a D orbital and so on. And then we have the superscript and that is the number of electrons that exist in that orbital. There is another way to draw that orbital diagram that describes the electron configuration by representing each orbital with a box and each electron with an arrow. So when we distribute electrons, we distribute it in the lowest energy orbitals first to get what we call the ground state configuration. Ground state is corresponding to the lowest energy state possible. So the electron always wants to go to the lowest energy orbital or the lowest energy state available for it. What determines the energy of each orbital compared to the others are three principles. First one is called the off-bow principle or the build-up principle. Um, and that simply states the fact that electrons need to be put in the lower energy orbitals first. However, orbital energies depend on both the n quantum number and the L quantum number. And that is an effect of two phenomena one of them is called the penetration effect, and the second one is called the shielding effect. We will discuss these two effects uh, in the next slide and discuss how they affect the energy of different orbitals. Then we have the exclusion principle, which simply says that any orbital can hold two electron maximum. These two electrons have to be paired up in opposite directions, and we will learn why next. And then finally, we have Hans rule, which simply says that in a subshell, if you have more than one orbital available in one subshell, electrons prefer to be unpaired because when they are unpaired, in this case, they will have lower energy. The whole point for these three principles is electrons go to lower energy orbitals first. So let's start with the off-bow principle or the build-up principle, how energy of orbitals compare to each other. According to Bohr's uh, atom, all the orbitals that belong to a certain energy level should have had the same energy. Both 2b and 2s should, should have had the same energy, and all 3s, 3p, and 3d should have had the same energy. However, this is not correct. This is not correct because it actually ignores a phenomenon that is called the shielding effect, which simply states that electrons feel smaller nuclear charge than what the nucleus actually has. What, what holds the electron to the atom is an electrostatic attraction force that is directly proportional to the charge of the nucleus and inversely proportional to the distance between the nucleus and the electron. So when the charge goes up, the attraction will go up. When the distance goes up, the attraction will go down. And we'll see how this explains what shielding effect is. So if we start with hydrogen, which has a nucleus with plus one charge and one electron, that electron is in energy level one, so it's at a certain distance, and it feels a whole charge of plus one, and it takes negative 2.18 uh, O2 joules to remove that electron and overcome the attraction. So that gives us a sense of how strong that attraction is. If we move to helium plus ion, this is uh, an ion that also has one electron in energy level one. However, that one electron, which mainly at the same distance as the electron of the hydrogen atom, but now it feels a plus two charge from the helium nucleus. 
So it feels higher charge. And as we said, higher charge will lead to higher attraction. So it will take much higher energy to remove it, negative 8.7202 joules to remove it. If we move to a helium atom, we see that the energy that it takes to remove one of these electrons is actually smaller than what it takes to remove one electron in the case of helium ion. However, it's larger than what it takes to remove one electron in case of the hydrogen atom, which means these two electrons, each one of them is actually feeling somehow a charge larger than plus one, yet smaller than plus two, which means that each one of these electrons is shielding part of the two plus charge of the nucleus from the other electron. So each one of them is feeling less than two plus, and that what makes the energy needed to remove it much smaller than the case of hydrogen ion. If you look at lithium, now we have a nucleus with a, a plus three charge. However, we have two electrons in energy level one, one electron in energy level two. What we found is that the energy needed to remove the electron, the outer electron, is much smaller than the energy that was needed to remove the electron in the hydrogen atom. And that can be correlated to two things here. First one is that the distance is much larger in case of lithium because now it's energy level two compared to energy level one in hydrogen. But also, it seems like the a outer electron is actually feeling somehow less than plus one nuclear charge, not even two, not three plus of the nuclear charge, which means that the two inner electrons completely kind of neutralized the plus charge of the nucleus and made the outer electron feel much smaller plus charge from the nucleus. That effect is called the shielding effect. The two inner electrons shielded the outer electron from feeling the attraction of the nuclear charge of the nucleus. That shielding effect is a result of the orbital penetration effect. So if we look at 3s compared to 3p and 3d orbitals, we see that they're mainly at a more or less the same distance from the nucleus. However, the s electron spends some time close to the nucleus or penetrates into the nucleus more than the p orbital, more than the d orbital. So that higher penetration makes it feel more attraction from the nucleus. So that explains why 3s has lower energy than 3p than 3d. Again, that's because 3s penetrates closer to the nucleus more than 3p, more than 3d, which make it feel more attraction and have lower energy compared to the uh, other orbitals. Now, orbitals that belong to the same energy level does not have the same energy. They will have different energies based on their penetration effect. 2s will have lower energy than 2p. 3s will have lower energy than 3p, which is lower than 3d. And that effect is actually getting more pronounced as you go to higher energy levels to the extent that even 4s will have lower energy than 3d. The order of energy for the orbitals is not straightforward. It does not only depend on the n quantum number. We have to take into account both the n and the l quantum numbers. It could potentially seem very confusing trying to determine which orbital is lower in energy compared to the others. And to make things easier, put the electrons in the orbitals in the order of increasing n plus l value. So, for example, 4s has an n quantum number of 4 and an l quantum number of 0. So, it will have a total of 4. 3d, on the other hand, will have an n equals 3 and an l equals 2. So, that's a total of 5. So you put electrons in 4s before you put it in 3d. If the n plus l value is the same, you go with the lower n first. So if you compare 4p with 3d, you will find that both of them have a sum of 5. However, 3d should go first because it has smaller n value. 
the exclusion principle simply says that no two electrons in any atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. What does this mean? Let's try to explain it by looking at when we try to put two electrons in a 1s orbital. So we put the first one, it's going to have an n equals 1 from that number here, an l value of 0, and an l value of 0, because this is an s orbital. If we put the second one, it will have the same set of quantum numbers, n equals 1, l equals 0, ml equals 0. Same thing here and here. Then we have to define a new quantum number that will allow us to differentiate between these two electrons because no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. And up till now, these two electrons have the same set of quantum numbers. So we have to invent something else that differentiates between them. And that new quantum number is the spin quantum number. So basically, the direction of the magnetic spin of the electrons. When the electron spins counterclockwise, it's going to have a spin up magnetic moment. And when it spins clockwise, it's going to have a spin down magnetic moment. So these two possibilities can be determined by a new quantum number called MS, the spin quantum number. And that has two values, one half and minus one half. Introducing that new quantum number will allow us to differentiate between the two electrons in one orbital, because one of them is going to have plus one half spin, which corresponds to spin up. The second one, in order to differentiate between these two electrons, has to have a minus one half spin or spin down. Putting both of them spin up will violate the exclusion principle, because they will have the same set of quantum numbers, which is not allowed. Any two electrons in the same orbital will always be paired up in that orientation right here with both of them in opposite directions in terms of spin with respect to each other. So we can apply uh, these rules so far, the build-up principle and Pauli exclusion principle to get electron configuration, depending on the atomic number of the element, we determine how much electrons do we have. So for hydrogen, we have one electron, and it should go to the lowest orbital available, which is going to be 1s. So hydrogen is going to have 1s1 configuration. Helium, two electrons, so we have a second one. We still have space in the 1s orbital, but, but according to this exclusion principle, it should go spin down in the opposite direction to the already existing electron. Lithium has three. Two of them will go to 1s in opposite directions. Third one will go to the next available orbital, which is 2s. Then we move to beryllium, four, two of them will go to 1s. And then the second two will go to 2s. And again, paired up in opposite directions. Then boron, five, two here, two here, and one here. Again, why did we put electrons in 2s before 2p? Because the sum of n plus l quantum numbers for 2s is 2, while that sum for 2p is 3. So we should put electrons in the, the orbital with lower sum first, 2s before 2p. And when we go to carbon, we have six electrons. So two of them will go to the 1s, two will go to the 2s, and then one here. And then that next one, we have the choice to either put it in the same p orbital paired up or put it in two separate p orbitals. So which one should, should we go with? Um, that is determined by Hund's rule, which states that unpaired electrons have lower energy. So putting them in two separate orbitals has lower energy than putting them paired up in the same orbital. Nitrogen, so it's gonna be two, that's seven, so it's gonna be two here, two here, so that's four, so we're left with three that will go unpaired. Oxygen, that's eight, two in one S, two in two S, and four that will go in two P, unpaired first, one, two, three, and then the fourth one has to be paired up. There is no choice. F, nine, two, four, six, eight, nine, and at the end, neon will have a complete energy level that is completely filled with 10 electrons that will completely fill all the available orbitals in energy level two.
the electrons that exist in completely filled energy levels are called core electrons, while those that exist in partially filled energy levels are called valence electrons. So if we look at lithium, for example, we'll have energy level one, which has two electrons, so it's completely filled. Those two electrons are core electrons, while the electron that exists in 2s orbital is a valence electron because it's in a partially filled orbital. Same thing for beryllium. Two electrons in the 1s are core electrons, and the two electrons in the 2s are valence electrons because that level is still partially filled because we still have empty p orbitals in that level. Core, those two are valence. Same thing here. This one is core, and those two are valence. This one is core, those two are valence, and so on. Up to neon, now all of the orbitals or the levels are completely filled. Now we have both energy level one and two completely filled. So both of them are going to be core electrons and energy level three is now partially filled. So now this is the valence electrons. Electrons that are in the core of the atom does not participate in any chemical reactions. All the chemical reactions and the properties are determined by electrons in the valence shell. And to focus on that fact, we replace the core electrons with the corresponding noble gas configuration. For all these examples here, the core electrons correspond to 1s2 configuration, which is the configuration of helium. So we can remove the 1s2 and replace it with helium and then put the configuration of the valence electrons in the orbital notation. And that's going to make things a lot easier for the heavier atoms. For example, if we look at sodium, now we will replace all of this with neon, and we will have 3s1 as the valence electron. So this makes the electron configuration much more simple to write. So if we look at silicon, for example, the full notation is going to be this one right here. And if you replace the core electrons, all of these, with the corresponding noble gas, neon, and keep the valence electrons, this is now in the noble gas notation, and it's, it looks much more simple than the extended notation. And it's not just about being simple to write. It's about the fact that it brings our attention to valence electrons, which are the ones that determine the chemical properties, as we will see in a minute. So valence electrons are electrons in the outermost in orbital that is partially filled. And those are the ones that determine the chemical properties of the atom, determines what type of reaction this atom will um, get involved in and so on. With the Nobel gas notation, it is much more easy to look and focus on the valence electrons in any element because we will have these valence electrons extended while the core electrons are replaced with the corresponding noble gas. That makes the number of valence electrons in each element correspond to the group number in the periodic table. So group one, all of them will have one valence electron in an S orbital, of course, in a successively higher energy level. Group seven will have seven valence electrons in uh, successively higher energy levels, starting from energy level two, three, four, five, and so on. And that is the same for all the groups in the periodic table. We see that group one corresponds to an S orbital with one electron valence configuration. Group two corresponds to an S orbital with two electrons. Group three is going to be S with two electrons, P with one electron, and so on. So it's going to be a successive filling of a P orbital up to completely filled configuration for the noble gases. And then we have the D orbital being filled in this block right here, which is called sometimes called the D block in the periodic table. And the F orbitals, both 4F and 5S, 5F filled in these two series here, which are called the F block elements. That explains the design of the periodic table. We have two groups here that correspond to the filling of the S orbital, six groups here that correspond to the successive filling of the P orbital, 
and 10 groups here that correspond to the successive filling of the D orbital and two series that correspond to the successive filling of 4F orbital and 5F orbital. Each period of the periodic table is going to correspond to an energy level. So period one corresponds to N equals one or energy level number one. Period two is going to be energy level number two and so on. And for each one of these periods, the configuration can be written like this. It's going to be filling the NS orbital, N minus 2F orbital, N minus 1D orbital, and NP orbital. Of course, for energy level 1, there is no F orbital or D orbital or P orbital, so it only fills an S orbital. Energy level 2 is going to fill the S orbital and the P orbital, no F or D. Let's go back to Helmholtz rule that we mentioned briefly previously, and which states that when you have more than one orbital available, electrons prefer to go unpaired because when they go unpaired, they will have lower energy. And that uh, is very obvious when you try to put the second electron in case of carbon, it goes in the second p orbital instead of pairing up with the first uh, p orbital. Same thing if you move to an N atom with one more electron, that one more electron will go unpaired in the third available p orbital rather than going pairing up with any one of the existing electrons in the other orbitals. When you have unpaired electrons, those electrons will show up as paramagnetic, which means they will respond to a magnet. They will get attracted to a magnet. So when you see unpaired electrons in your configuration, you can predict that this substance is going to be paramagnetic and vice versa. If you experimentally find that a, an element is paramagnetic, that's because it has unpaired electrons in it. On the other hand, paired up electrons are diamagnetic. They don't get attracted to the magnet. That means that when you have all paired up electrons in your, in your configuration, you should predict that this element is going to be diamagnetic and vice versa. If you experimentally find an element to be diamagnetic, that automatically makes you predict that all the electrons in that element has to be paired up. Okay, our next topic is how to find the electron configuration for ions. You start by finding the electron configuration of the neutral atom and then add or remove electrons according to the charge of your ion. Um, and when you add electrons, you add them to the orbital with the lower energy first. When you remove electrons, you remove them from the orbital with the higher in quantum number first. 